Business news from the Capital Region. This is Washington Business Report with ABC7 National Correspondent Rebecca Cooper. Welcome back. Let's get straight to it. We've got lots of topics this week for the roundtable from local businesses with big possible IPOs expected or at least hoped for. And just that's happening just when there's daily deal fatigue to your own business and why now's the time to get a succession plan in place. But first, you've heard plenty this week about what night the president will actually be allowed to speak to Congress. But given Friday's frightful jobs report, what will he actually say that Congress might do? Joining us, Politico's Jonathan Allen, Bill Fluke from the Washington Business Journal, and business law attorney Jason Smolin of N Northern Virginia's Smolin Plevy Law Firm. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Jonathan, let's start with you. We've heard, d debated, and discussed much this week uh, the president's uh, being dissed somewhat for coming on Wednesday. I say the president probably should have not asked for Wednesday night, but getting beyond what night he's going to speak. What does Congress want to hear from the president that they may actually do? Well, I don't think there's a lot that they're going to do. And frankly, I'm not sure that Congress, or at least uh, the House Republicans, who would be integral to getting anything implemented, uh, really necessarily want to hear from the president. I, I think we're, we're like to he likely to hear from them that his plans won't actually take the country in the right direction, almost no matter what he says. I think the president wants an audience with Congress because he wants to be able to set up a contrast between his plans and what uh, Congress would do and also uh, show Congress to be obstructionist. So I think there's a lot of politics going on here. You're not going to see uh, a lot of the president's agenda, whatever it is, implemented by a Republican House of Representatives. So as it turns out, now we will get to hear from the Republicans first. We've got the big, highly anticipated Politico NBC News debate at the Reagan Library Wednesday night. Mitt Romney on Friday saying there's zero faith in Barack Obama because that's how many jobs he produced uh, in his latest jobs report. Zero. But even Chris Van Hollen uh, was on the airwaves on Friday acknowledging it is a disappointing jobs report. How much uh, is there an acknowledgement that they've got to do something or is it just simply too political of a year to do that? Well, anything? I think there's an acknowledgement, uh, at least on the part of the White House, that uh, a, they, they need to try to do something. Uh, and if they're not going to be able to do something to make sure that the blame rests uh, with Congress, of course, Congress is going to try to do the same thing. Not surprising at all that uh, that Congressman Van Hollen would look at a zero net gain jobs report and say that's disappointing. If he said anything else, he shouldn't be in elective <laughs> office. Um, so, uh, you know, that shouldn't be terribly surprising. I do think uh, it's going to be very hard for these guys to get together and, and do anything that produces jobs. And frankly, uh, you know, a lot of these economic trends are, are beyond the capacity of government to, to make short term changes. I heard some speculation that, you know, the benefit of putting the speech off by another day is it gives them another day to try and figure out what to do and what they can propose. So let's turn to Bill Fluke and place that there actually are jobs in the Washington region. Living Social, we like to talk about Living Social because it's been such a success in the Daily Deals arena, taking on Groupon. There's been a little bit of to and fro that you've been writing about this week. The fairly odd uh, CEO of Groupon, a memo leaking out about their hotly anticipated IPO. Tell us what you've been writing about. This is uh, Groupon, obviously the number one daily deal player. They're based in Chicago, and their CEO is a bit of a, bit of a bomb thrower. And he, he inked this memo, which was sort of suspiciously leaked to the press, um, which actually might violate the SEC quiet period, which is another, another hiccup for Groupon along the way. But took some shots at their critics uh, in the press, um, a lot of their competition, not the least of which Living Social, which they sort of blasted as much smaller um, and, and uh, much less significant than Groupon. Totally trying to dismiss Living Social uh, and let you write. You write. It's difficult to dismiss Living Social. They're surviving when Yelp and Facebook and some others that have tried to get into this market are not succeeding. But you also say they're succeeding, and yet there is definitely daily deal fatigue. I love my Living Social coupons. I love Groupon, but I can't keep up with all the different office offers that are being made. I mean, at this point, Groupon. Explosive, explosively grew. Living Social came up right in their wake, and now there's hundreds and hundreds of daily deal startups. And uh, we saw this month that, that Facebook has, has completely gotten out of the game. Yelp has significantly pulled back. So I think this, what this says is we're, we're reaching a second chapter in the industry when the, some guys are going to get winnowed out, when there's fatigue on the part of merchants and consumers that they're really just inundated with these deals and they're not going to be able to support the number of players in this industry right now. What does that mean for Living Social's growth? They've been such a jobs machine in our area. Right. They're, they have they're at, uh, 3,500 people right now, about 600 people in the Washington area. And I think they're still going to be growing. Groupon is still going to be growing. 
but the question is whether that growth starts decelerating over the next couple months, whether their, their, their revenue growth is eventually going to be flat and uh, going to reach its peak. Um, and, and that's a big problem because these guys need to keep expanding for this model to work. So Jason Smolin, let's turn to you because not only does uh, Groupon CEO get attention for his memos, but you can even watch him doing his yoga poses on YouTube. And right. CEOs always get attention in terms of the, the lifeblood of a company, and for good reason. Uh, you say that not enough companies, however, have strong succession plans already in place. What's your advice to them? Well, that's correct. I mean, a lot of companies, it, it's a very long process, and waiting for the last minute is the worst thing you could do. Uh, the situation with Steve Jobs uh, leaving Apple it would seem like it was last minute, but I would suggest he's actually done a very good job in the sense that he brought on Tim Cook over 10 years ago, gave him a chance to grow within the company under his auspices, uh, and surrounded himself with a very, very good team. And that advice is scalable to almost any kind of business. Now, do you, do you, is your advice to let the public and your shareholders know who the successor is? You look at uh, Rupert Murdoch and how he had to back away from his son and the succession plan to please the shareholders. Uh, you look at Conan O'Brien and Jay Leno. <laughs> right. It doesn't always work, it seems, to name too far in advance to the public who the successor will be. Well, I think that's correct, because sometimes watching the sausage made is not good. And when you have a situation where, for example, Warren Buffett, um, pretty quiet about what's going to happen there. He's 80 years old. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of a statement. You know, cemeteries are filled with indispensable people, <laughs> and you know, we all go and we all have to be replaced, and we all can be replaced. Uh, planning now is a lot better, but you don't necessarily have to give a blow by blow to the public because that creates a lot of frictional transaction friction. When I was at CNN Financial News, I interviewed Martha Stewart before her IPO, and I asked her about her succession plan. And she truly looked angered by the question as if anyone could replace her. And it might have had something to do with the fact that I framed it in terms of if you were to fall off a ladder tomorrow, what, would, uh, what should the shareholders know about the company succeeding? But she went to jail and no one right. planned for that. You say five years uh, at the very minimum planning for your retirement, ten years even better. Shouldn't they have one in case of any kind of uh, eventuality with the CEO? Well, you know, business is fussy and life is fussy and, you know, when I say you should be planning five or ten years in advance, that's a constant move. You know, you should always be going forward. Uh, but the idea is, you know, if you have plans in place from five years ago, I can tell you they're probably not likely very good plans today. You just have to have a dynamic process of continuously making these plans. And as we know, uh, companies are a matter of people. And it's really, in the case that you were mentioning, maybe ego was a big factor there. But for a lot of other people, it's who you bring in and who's right at the right time. Okay, with Barack Obama trying to keep his job in line and uh, Living Social trying to keep growing jobs and Steve Jobs leaving his, all kinds of uh, good insight from our roundtable today. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us.